I want to welcome you this morning, and I want to thank you. I need to take a poll. How many of you were here when we started this Old Testament survey two and a half years ago? Amazing! Thank you for bearing with us. You have had over 1,500 pages of lessons handed out to you, which means everybody who's been involved in duplicating those things, I want to say thank you too, and I'd ask you to help me thank them. That's a lot of people staying up sometimes very late on, when, on Saturday night. I don't email those out until 2 o'clock on Saturday afternoon for the final product. I email one product out Friday night, but then the final one goes out to print on Saturday. And it's amazing to me, especially on the few times where I've emailed out 29-page <laughs> lessons, how they have managed to do it and still make church the next morning. So I want to thank them. You know, when, I, when Becky and I were growing up, there was a lady who was a friend of ours who made the most fantastic spaghetti sauce that uh, uh, I've ever eaten, except for my moms and wives. Um, but other than that, uh, the best I'd ever eaten. And I asked her, I said, can I have a copy of your recipe? She gave it to me on a three by five typed card. And to this day, I regret losing that card. I did make it. I made it several times. It was a really weird recipe to me because if I was going to figure out how to make spaghetti sauce on my own, I'd just take all the ingredients, I'd stick them in the pot, and I'd come back in a few hours ready to eat it. But that's not the way this recipe went. You'd brown the meat and drain off the excess grease. You'd add tomatoes and tomato sauce and tomato paste and tomato juice. You'd cut up onions and smash garlic and put it all in there. You'd put in some olive oil, put in some salt and pepper, and you would add spices. But you didn't add them all at the same time. Now, the first time I made it, I thought, well, this is ridiculous. And I did dump everything in there at one time, and it just didn't taste quite the same. So being the nerd that I am, I went to the library and I researched it. It turns out, that spices develop their full flavor profile at a different time and rate. So some spices, if you cook them for an hour, they taste perfect afterwards. Other spices taste bitter if they've been in there that long. So you put in the spices at a different time, and from there on out, I tried to follow the recipe more carefully. Ultimately, you simmered this sauce down, and as you simmered it down, it took on its fullest flavor at the time that it was done. To me, that's a wonderful analogy that I want to do because as we have gone through the Old Testament in this class, God did not stop putting His holy scriptures together until He had put every one of the books we've studied in there. And then once he'd put them all in there, it was not then a question of, okay, now it's time for the Messiah. After God put all of the books in there, the people of Israel needed to live within the framework of those holy scriptures. And they needed to live within the framework of them for several centuries with no new prophetic word coming out. They were simmering like the sauce until the time was right for the Messiah and God's final word. And so that's what we have. And it looks like the last book that was likely written was the prophetic book of Malachi. It certainly lasts in the order that we've got them in our Bible, but you can't count that for being right. Our Bible order is not chronology. But it happens to be the book that the arguments are that I believe best support the idea that it was written last. So we've got this book, and, I want, and it's during the second, second temple period. It's, it's in the timeline where we've put it in the study of this class. And I want to tell you about it this morning. It's easy to understand. The book has six different dialogues. It's conversation between God and man. More specifically, between God and Israel. So you've got this conversation, you've got this dialogue, and each one follows the same pattern. First, God will, or the prophet on behalf of God, will make an assertion. 
he'll say, this is the way it is. Then the people challenge that or they reply to it and they say, well, and they ask a question. And then the third part is where God responds and explains and answers the challenge of the people. So that's the format, and that's the way it is. Now, before we get into the dialogues themselves, and there are six of them, before we get into them, I want to tell you how those six dialogues themselves are arranged. So if we can look at the Elmo for just a moment. You'll recall we have talked in this class about, um, uh, let's get this set right. We have talked in this class about key asms or chiasms. You all remember those? Okay, we've seen them over and over. In fact, if you were here long enough ago, the Tower of Babel story in Genesis, one of the earliest stories in the Bible, is written with this same Jewish structure. And it comes from the Greek letter key, which looks like an X. And the idea is everything goes to a center point, which would be there. And then after that center point, it looks the same on both sides. So we haven't used that structure. Instead, what we've done is we've said it kind of goes, you can look at it like this. So you have dialogue one, dialogue two, dialogue three and four, dialogue five, and dialogue six. And these match. These match. And those match and are actually the focus point. And that's so different than the way we write today. Because the way we write today, we put the focus point at the beginning or at the end. They buried it in the middle. But that's because the arrow points to it if you line these stories up. So if we go back to the PowerPoint for a moment... The way the chiasm is, is formed here is very much to a point, as I showed you. The first dialogue is where the people start questioning God's love. You don't really love me. This, that's going to match up with the final dialogue where they question his justice. You're not really just. You're not a fair God. The second one is... God saying, you the people don't love me. You're failing to honor me. Don't say, I question your love, God. You don't have the honor and the love and the respect for me that you should. And that matches up with dialogue five, which is the same thing. You don't honor God. And then the focus dialogues, three or four, deal with the unfaithfulness of the people compared with the faithfulness of God. And that's the driving message of this book. So, with that, let's look at the first dialogue. In the first dialogue, the people question God's love. Now, I told you these dialogues have three principal parts. They follow this formula. In the handout, I've called it part A, B, and C. But A is the assertion, and God makes it, and then the people challenge that, and then after that, God responds and gives his answer. So, we look at that here with Malachi 1, and the first one's real short, and it's real easy to follow. So, let's just take it and, and digest it together and look at the text. It starts, well, we, the first verse of the book is just kind of an introductory. This is the oracle of the word of Yahweh to Israel by Malachi. All right? Now, here is our first dialogue. Dialogue one. I have loved you, says the Lord. That's the assertion. God says, I have loved you. Now, I get to ask you to put yourself in the shoes of the Jews reading this at the time. I have loved you, God says. And then the challenge, part B. The people say, but you say, how? How have you loved us? You call this love? We've been exiled. We've been trampled upon. We no longer have our nation. 
Our people live all over the world. You call this love? How have you loved us, God? And then there's part C, the response. Isn't Esau Jacob's brother? Remember, Jacob and Esau were twins. Esau is the father of the Edomites, the neighbors of Israel. Israel got conquered by Babylon. The Edomites did not because they never rebelled. They kept paying their tithes. So Israel's sitting there thinking, the Edomites, they taunt us, they make fun of us. They're better off than we are. We got exiled. Our temple got destroyed. Jerusalem got overrun. The walls were knocked down. You didn't do squat to the Edomites, but you let all of this happen to us. You don't love us. Well, isn't Esau Jacob's brother, declares the Lord. Yet I've loved Jacob, and Esau I have hated. I have laid waste his hill country. I've left his heritage to jackals of the desert. If Edom says, we're shattered, but we'll rebuild, the Lord of hosts says, well, they may build, but I'm just going to tear it down again. And you'll see this, and you'll say, great is Yahweh beyond the border of Israel. That's what it says. And we're going to delve into that in a moment. But God's saying, time out. Don't look at things from the moment of history where you stand right now. Love and justice is bigger than the moment. If you were simply to look at me as a father to my children, during that one moment in history, after they have been disciplined... And they are having to live with the consequences of the discipline. Maybe I took away their cell phone. <gasps> Maybe I banned them from the internet <gasps> for a week. Oh, you could look at just that moment and say, what a harsh father. He doesn't let his child have a cell phone or be on the internet. Well, at that moment, no, he doesn't. But it's in a much bigger picture. And it actually is a, an indication that I am a caring father. Because it would be a whole lot easier not to listen to the whining that happens when you do such a thing to your child. So th these people, they're stuck in that moment. And... and, and Malachi is showing some of that because what he's saying, he's actually, Malachi has quoted some of the Jeremiah language where Jeremiah says that God will lay waste Jerusalem and it will be a haven for the jackals. And so Malachi has pulled that back and said, same thing's going to happen to Edom, except Edom won't be rebuilt. At least you're being rebuilt because Jacob I loved and Esau I hated. Now, so if we look back, let's go to the PowerPoint. If we look at this, the assertion is, I have loved you. The challenge is, oh yeah, how? And then the response is there. Now we need to pause for a commercial break. So leave the dialogues alone for a minute because some of you are out there saying, rather harsh. Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. Ooh, what kind of God have we? So let's talk for a moment on the Hebrew words that we've got here. First, the Hebrew word for love, ahav. Ahav is the Hebrew word for love. Now, we think of love, especially after Billy Shakespeare and all of his plays, we have a tendency to think of love as that ooey, gooey feeling that we fall into or fall out of. That was not the concept behind the Hebrew word ahav. Ahav means very much more so a choice or an action. This is something I'm choosing. This is a way that I am acting. This is me showing that this is my choice with care and attention. We've got to get out of that 
21st century mind frame here and understand the idea of a choice. So I pulled a verse for you to look at, Isaiah 123. And I pulled this because if you've been in this class, you know Hebrew poetry has one statement and then another statement that runs parallel. And it helps you nuance meanings of words and ideas. So we've got that here. Everyone loves a bribe and runs after gifts. Now, the second line is a restatement of the first. So look at that first line. Everyone loves a bribe. You don't have to answer out loud, but here's your question. Loves has a parallel in the second line. What is the parallel? You can answer out loud. Runs after. Love means to choose, to act, to run after. It doesn't mean everyone loves a bribe and feels all gooey emotional about gifts. And the gifts here are gifts that are given to you to get you to do something for someone else, a.k.a. a bribe. So this is the, the idea of Jacob I loved does not mean God was having a gooey emotional moment over Jacob means he picked them. That's my choice. That's where the covenant promises I gave to Abraham are going to come. I'm going to take them from Abraham, Isaac, to Jacob, not to Esau, which brings us to a Hebrew word of hate, Shana. Shana, Hebrew for hate. It also is not hate in the sense of this vitriolic distaste and disgust that makes you want to spit every time you see them. There actually is a Hebrew word for that, it's, but it's generally translated in our Bibles, abhor. I abhor you. Hate is much more of, this is not what I'm picking. This is not what I'm choosing. Good passage to show this. Jacob had two wives, Leah and Rachel. One of them, he picked a whole bunch. One of them, he didn't really pick. She kind of got, he got suckered into taking her. Remember? Okay. Genesis 29, 31. When the Lord saw that Leah was hated, he opened her womb. Well, I mean, this wasn't Jacob. I hate my wife. It was, she's not the one he's picking. She wasn't his pick. She wasn't his choice. Sana is a choice or an action, which brings us to Romans 9, 6 through 12. I mean, while we're having freebies in class and commercial moments, this is a passage that may be in your brain because it's always used in the arguments pro and con on predestination. Here's the argument. Romans 9. This is Paul writing to the church at Rome. It says, don't think the word of God failed. Not everyone who descended from Israel belongs to Israel. They're not all children of Abraham just because they're genetically related to him. He was sa it was said in Scripture, through Isaac your offspring will be named. So the blessing's going to come through Isaac. This means it's not the children of the flesh who are the children of God. It's the children of promise. And what the promise said, this time next year, Sarah will have a son. And so, Rebekah conceived children by Isaac. And even though they were not yet born, they'd not done anything good or bad in order that God's purpose of choice... Election is choice. In order that God's purpose of election or choice might continue. And not because of works. This is not God saying, oh, I'm going to do it. I'm going to choose based on who's doing what today. But it's just God's call. Rebecca was told, the older will serve the younger, as it's written in Malachi. Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. It's not saying he has some intense dislike for Esau and the Edomites. In fact, the Israelites were commanded that they weren't allowed to abhor the Edomites because they were brothers. There, that word is abhor. That's the 
spit word. This is choice. This is choice. So don't get all upset when you read Jacob I loved and Esau I hated and think, oh, what an unfair God. No, he's just saying it's, this isn't about emotion. This is, I picked one. I did not pick the other. This is what he's saying. Don't ask, if we can go back to the PowerPoint, please. He's saying, don't ask how have I loved you. I loved you because I picked you. The whole reason you've had discipline is because your father who loves you is at work in you to do something greater beyond you. God promised to Abraham a descendant through whom the world would be blessed. Now this is the last book in the sauce. Before the sauce simmers for a couple of hundred years and the flavor profile is brought out. But this is a very important ingredient for them to understand the love of God is there because it was a promise to Abraham that was going to come through them. The children of Jacob, not the Edomites. So when you reach that moment, point for home. When you reach that moment where you're saying, how does God love me? My response to you is, just trust him. When you got the challenge in front of you that says, where is God in this? Why has he abandoned me? Is this the way he treats his children? Trust. He chose you. Paul gives that same assurance. You were chosen in Christ before the creation of the world. So don't be like Tevye and Fiddler on the Roof. Remember the scene? Oh God... You know, I understand we're your chosen people, but every now and then, can't you choose someone else? Because his life is so hard. Don't be like that. Just trust him. All right. That was question number one, dialogue number one. Now let's look at dialogue number two. Here, while the people are accusing God of not loving them, the truth of the matter is the people don't love God. And this is 1, 6 through 2, 9. Let's look at it briefly over here. We're not going to make it through all six dialogues. We're going to have to pick and choose. But you've got them in front of you. You can take it home and read it. Um, here's the, here it is. A son honors his father and a servant his master. That's a gimme, right? Well, if I'm a father, where's my honor? This is God talking. If I'm a master, then why aren't you afraid of me? says the Lord of hosts to the priest who despise my name. But you say, well, how do we despise your name? What do we say about you? That's the defiant challenge. Now that pattern I told you of assertion, challenge, response, in the two chiasms, the two point, the dialogue two and five that marry up together, they've got just a little bit of twist to them. They have two challenges and two responses, but they both do it because it's a chiasm. So they're I mean, it's really cool, really patterned. Anyway, so he says, they say, how did we despise your name? His answer, you offered polluted food on the altar. They say, oh, who polluted your food? How have we polluted you? And then the answer, by saying the Lord's table may be despised. Look, you're offering your blind animals in sacrifice. You're taking your lame animals and your sick animals, and that's what you're offering in sacrifice. You don't give the best lamb to the Lord in sacrifice. You say, well, this is a call lamb. We need to get it out of the flock anyway, lest it breed. It's lame, it's blind, it's, it's ugly, it's sickly. So let's give that one to the Lord. And here's the challenge. Just try presenting that to your governor in payment of your taxes. Do you think he's going to accept it or show you favor, says the Lord of hosts? And over and over, over and over in Malachi, we read Lord of hosts, Lord of hosts, Lord of hosts. And the people, oh, we're so worn out, snorting at the Lord of hosts. 
Oh, we got to offer another sacrifice. It's another sacrifice day. Well, get, get the sick one. Get old blindy instead of blondie. Bring that one to the Lord. God says, you think I'm going to accept that offering from your hand? No, it's not going to happen. Here are the priorities that Israel had. Israelite priorities. Number one, pay your taxes. Government can kill you. Now, back then, that was literally true. I don't think it's literally true as much today, but it's pretty close. Okay, pay your taxes. Number two, take care of number one. And number three is kind of an afterthought. Oh, uh, we got to do something for God. Okay, get the sick one. God needs his. And over and over and over, God's calling himself the Lord of hosts. Over and over and over. And if we took time to keep reading through that, he'd say, listen, you may not be offering me a legitimate sacrifice, but all of the nations of the world will. It's just a matter of time until everybody all over this world in every nation, people are sacrificing to me. Israel, I should not be your afterthought. Heaven forbid you offer me, the king of kings, something that would get you killed if you tried to pa pass it off to your governor and for your taxes. Then he compares himself through here. He says, I'm going to compare the people of Israel to me, God. Let's start with size. Israel at this time is about 20 by 30 miles. That's it. We think of it as this massive land. At this point in time, Judah is 20 by 30 miles. It would not stretch from here to downtown much further anyway. That's it. God, he wins this one. He's the God of the universe. All right, so Israel's sitting there thinking, okay, well, he's got us on size. Feared. Do you think anybody feared Israel? No, nobody feared Israel. God makes it a point in Malachi to say on fear, all of the nations will fear God. King. Israel doesn't even have one. They don't have a king. Their kingship is gone, never to be restored, save by the king of kings. But God, he is king of kings. Army. Israel doesn't have an army. They're not allowed to have an army. This is a diddly squat, do-nothing, backwater part of the empire that's offending the Lord of hosts. And I showed you Lord of hosts this short little book of Malachi uses it more than any other book in the Old Testament. Do you know what the Hebrew word host means? Army. It's just God rubbing in the fact that he has an army. They don't. Army. God wins on that one too. So why would Israel treat God so poorly? I have a suggested answer. You don't see him in a visible, physical way. You don't, you don't see him in a visible, physical way. Oh, I see you, and you're the people of God and the body of Christ, and I see by your actions and your love that God is genuine and God is real and God reaches out and God works. I see that in you. But see, physically, God doesn't happen. So we can ignore what we do not see, or so we think. And God says, you offer blind animals in sacrifice, and you snort, say, again, okay, it's sacrifice time. Get, get the sick one. Let's go on down, give it to the temple. We don't want God exiling us anymore. Got to satisfy the big man upstairs. How disrespectful. Oh, God, would you help me gladly give you the very best I've got? Can I please, Lord, 
in my life day by day, show you honor and respect by giving you the best. Give you the best of my energy, the best of my time, the best of my attention and focus and love, the best of my devotion. I don't want anything else to trump that. And if you're one of the ones who's saying, well, yeah, but what about family? You showing the right love and dedication and focus on your family is honoring God. That's the first thing he's told you to do. But there's a different way to do it than that and greed and, and soaking it in. Okay, dialogue three, the people's unfaithfulness. We're going to cut through this one pretty quick. The people are unfaithful. God says, I no longer accept your offerings. And the people say, why not? And God says, because you're not faithful. You're not faithful to your wives. You're not faithful. You're going out. You know, and, and it's one of the most tremendous marriage passages in the Bible. So it's worth reading, especially if uh, uh, you're about to perform a wedding. Because it's like really good. It really shows this idea that a wedding is not simply a covenant between two people. It's a covenant that involves God. And that's why God says when you are messing with marriage, you are messing with your covenant with God. Don't do it. So I'm going to ask you to do what Malachi says instead. Guard yourselves in your spirit. The guard that you set up starts with your heart. And it starts with your mind. Watch what you watch on TV. Watch what you watch in the movies. Watch what you look at on the internet. Watch how you treat people. Watch all of the things that proceed from your heart. Watch those words that you want to say that you really shouldn't say. Guard yourselves in your spirit first because sin sneaks in. And sin is not simply a matter of us messing up our life. We are his people, and we live in covenant with him. And sin disturbs that. And so we need to be careful with it. Now, I, if we remember the chiasm, dialogue 3 and dialogue 4 go together on unfaithfulness. Because God in dialogue 3 says the people are unfaithful. In dialogue 4, the people say, well, God, we think you're unfaithful. It just amazes me. Look at dialogue four. Let's actually go into that one for a moment. It starts at 2.17. Malachi 2.17. Here we go. You have wearied Yahweh with your words. But you say, see that's, that's the allegation, that's the accusation. But you say, here's the, the question, the challenge. Well, how did we weary him? And the answer is, everyone who does evil is good in the sight of the Lord. This is what the people were saying. They were saying, every bad person God loves. He's taking care of all of the evildoers. He's treating the good people horribly while the bad people have it on easy street. He delights, God delights in them. Where is his justice? Where's God doing anything fair? And God says, behold, I'm going to send my messenger and he's going to prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple and the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight. Behold, he's coming, says the Lord of hosts. Now, I want to get into this in some more detail, but read it with me so the words are fresh in your mind. He says, I'm going to send my messenger. He's going to prepare the way, and the Lord will suddenly come to his temple. In fact, let's pause for just a moment there. Let's go back to the PowerPoint. I'm going to send my messenger. There's a Hebrew pun here. The pun is on that word. Now that word that you've got in front of you, if you were reading it in Hebrew, you would read it as Malachi, Malachi. It's the name of the book. It's the name of the prophet. The name of the prophet literally means my messenger. But there's a pun here because that's not the only messenger that God's talking about. He's talking about a messenger he will send in the future. 
Now, here's what happened. Let's put our history that we've learned together. Let's look at Yahweh and the temple. First temple was built by whom? Solomon. And when Solomon built the temple, they had this elaborate celebration. They sacrificed. They had worship. They had readings. They had all of this stuff. And then what happened in the temple? The glory of the Lord came down. And the smoke was so thick you couldn't see in front of you and no one could serve in the temple because the presence of God manifested itself in that temple. Temple gets destroyed. Jews go into captivity. Jews come back under Ezra. They rebuild the temple. They have big dedication of the temple. They sacrifice. They pray. They read. They do all the same things Solomon did. And what happens? Nothing. There's no big cloud. There's no big smoke. There's no big visible presence of the Lord. And it's so interesting to read old Jewish rabbis from the time of Christ who are really perplexed by this. Why hasn't the glory of the Lord shown itself in the temple? In Solomon's day, the temple had a physical manifestation of the Lord. But where is it here? Where is it here? Go back briefly to this. The promise from God through Malachi is, first I'm sending my messenger, then he's going to prepare the way before me, and the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. It's going to happen. We go back here for a moment. So the Christ child is born. And his parents take him to the temple to dedicate him. And there's an old Jewish fellow named Simeon who'd been filled with the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit had told him, you will not die until you see the glory of the Lord come into his temple. And when Mary and Joseph bring the Christ child up the steps, Simeon is there. And Simeon takes the Christ child in his arms and says by the Holy Spirit, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your words for my eyes have seen your salvation that you have prepared in the presence of all peoples. A light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. And the glory of the Lord entered that temple. The sauce just needed to simmer. But all the ingredients are there once Malachi's done. If we had kept reading the Malachi passage, you'd see that when Jesus comes, he comes in judgment, but he also comes as a refiner's fire to purify. And there are two sets of people. There are those who see him as Lord, and those are the ones he purifies and makes clean. And there are those who don't, and those are the ones who walk in judgment. Because no one can stand when he appears. You just can't. Malachi says it. Paul said the same thing in Philippians 2. That every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Christ Jesus is Lord. And you see people today and you say, oh, well, they stand in the presence of the Lord. and They're not bowing down and their tongue's not confessing. The story isn't over. Because in the end of time, every knee shall bow and every tongue confess. Don't get so caught up in today that you lose track of where things are going. All right, let's go to the next one. Dialogue number five. This is a, goes with dialogue number two, the people's failure to honor God. It's in 3 verse 6. We'll look at it briefly because there's a, a fun little thing going on here in the Hebrew that we want to catch. I, the Lord, do not change. Therefore, you, O children of Jacob... Are not consumed. Isn't that unusual? Children of Jacob. Why would he call them children of Jacob? Why not children of Abraham or Isaac? How about Israel? Because that's what he calls them in chapter 1, verse 1. No, here it's children of Jacob. I, the Lord, don't change. Therefore, you, O children of Jacob, are not consumed. 
From the days of your fathers, you've turned aside from my statutes. You've not kept them. You return to me, and I'll return to you, says the Lord of hosts. Then here's part B. But you say, well, how are we supposed to return? God's answer, are you going to rob God? You are robbing me. You say, well, how have we robbed you? Answer, check your bank account. In your tithes and contribution, tithe is the Hebrew word for tenths. In your tenths. You're not giving your tenths, you're not giving your contributions, and so you're cursed. And that's robbing me, God says, or defrauding me. It's another way to translate it. Let's talk about it. There's a Hebrew pun there. He's almost saying, look, this is just natural for you guys, children of Jacob. You're children of Jacob in a different way. You're not called to be children of Jacob. You're called to be children of Israel. What's the difference between Jacob and Israel? Same guy. Jacob was the boy that was born that cheated his brother Esau out of his birthright, lied to his father Isaac about who he was, goes off, gets cheated in return by his father-in-law Laban, but finally reaches a point of dedication to the Lord. And in that point of dedication, as he builds the altar at Bethel, God says, I'm going to call you Israel instead of Jacob. You're not the cheater anymore. God calls them the children of the cheater. That word right there, I want you to look at it for a moment. It's yachva. Yachva. Yachva is Hebrew. It means to rob. It means to defraud. It's the word being used here. Why do you rob me? Why do you yachva me? Now I want you to look at another word. Now, many of you who were in here when we learned our Hebrew alphabet will pick up on this. If not, it's not hard. This is like one of them matchem things. You read Hebrew from right to left. So on the right, you've got that little apostrophe-looking thing. It's the yod, it's the hand, it's the fist at the top of a hand. And, and, and you got that? Well, it's in the top word and the bottom word, right? Now, the next one, on the top, it's got that thing that looks like a, a backwards Q. And you'll see that's in the bottom, too. It's just scooted over one. And then the bait in the top is at the last letter on the bottom. And then at the top, you've got that Y-looking letter, which is the second. It's basically the same word. They just shifted one letter over two spots. Do you all sort of see that, some of you? Do you know what that bottom word is? Instead of Yahba, it's Yahab. It means Jacob. He's just making a pun there. Jacob the deceiver. You've been robbing because you're children of the thief, of the robber. And the interesting thing is, is God says, as you're robbing me by not giving your tithe, I'm withholding blessing from you. But if you will quit robbing me, put me to the test and see if I don't give you even more blessings. Now, think of the bizarreness of this logic. God is so unhuman. Humans would never think of this. Can you imagine someone coming up to you on the street before they get in Judge Clinton's court because they get caught by Constable Hickman? Someone comes up to you and says, I'm robbing you. And you say to him, okay, look, I got like 30 bucks on me. But if you will not rob me, if we can just call this whole thing off, I'll come see you tomorrow if you'll give me your address and I'll give you $100. That's nutty. That's really what God's saying here. Why are you robbing me? It's a lack of trust. You just don't trust me. You just don't really, when the rubber hits the road, you don't think I can meet your needs. You don't think I'm really serious. You don't think I'm really paying attention to you. I am. So trust me. Quit robbing God and he'll give you more. Last dialogue. We got three minutes. Let's see if we can cover some of it at least. The people question God's justice. And, and I really, really like this dialogue, okay? Um, uh, so we got to look at just a little of it because there's some stuff in here you just need to, to know came from Malachi. You may already know it, but let's know where it came from, if nothing else. God says, your words have been hard against me. You say, how have we spoken against you? God says, you've said it's vain to serve God. 
What good does it do us? What does it profit us if we keep his charge or if we walk as in mourning before the Lord of hosts? We call the arrogant blessed. Evildoers not only prosper, they put God to the test and they escape. Then, those who feared the Lord spoke with one another. The Lord paid attention. He heard him. A book of remembrance was written before him of those who feared the Lord and esteemed his name. They shall be mine, says the Lord of hosts. In the day when I make up my treasured possession, I'll spare them as a man spares his son who serves them. Then once more you'll see the distinction between the righteous and the wicked. For behold, watch this carefully please. The day is coming, burning like an oven, when all the arrogant and all evildoers will be stubble. The day that's coming shall set them ablaze. It won't leave them a root, it won't leave them a branch. But for you who fear my name, the sun of righteousness shall rise with healing in its wings. Charles Wesley, third verse, hark the herald angels sing. Hail the newborn prince of peace, hail the son of righteousness, light and life to all he brings, risen with healing in his wings. Healing in his wings. You go back and look at Matthew, Mark, and Luke where Jesus is walking and a woman in one of the stories comes up, sneaks up behind him because she doesn't want to draw attention in heaven. He wouldn't talk to a woman, would he? Well, of course he would, but a normal Jew would not, Jewish rabbi. So she comes up and she touches the hem of his garment. The word for him is the Greek word that they used for the tassels, the four tassels that an Orthodox Jew would wear on his clothes. Because he was commanded to wear them in numbers. In the passage that says you wear those tassels on the wings of your robe. She touches the wings of his robe and she is healed. Jesus was the perfect answer to these prophecies. Jesus is the one who at the end of the prophetic book... I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. He will turn the hearts of fathers to their children and children to their fathers. And it's coming. But in the meantime, remember the law of my servant Moses, the statutes and rules I've commanded him. Why? Because, if we go back to the PowerPoint, that's what the sauce needs. The sauce needs it. The sauce says, you pay attention to the law because this law is going to point you to Jesus, as Paul said in Galatians. This is the law, and Elijah will come first. The gospel writers say that was John the Baptist, but it was also Elijah himself, lest anybody think God missed it on the Mount of Transfiguration. And then the Son of Righteousness, risen with healing in his wings. So, final point for home. Those who feared the Lord spoke with one another. The Lord paid attention and heard them. I got options. I can pay attention or not. I want to pray over you, but I want to start. Uh, before I do, I just want to say thank you for all the support, the prayers, the love, the encouragement that you've given us over the last two and a half years in this class. You put up with uh, stumbles and bumbles and all sorts of things. And I really, as a person, want to say thank you. I appreciate you guys very much. Would you pray with me? Lord, I ask your blessing over our class. And as we move through uh, uh, the studies we have in the future, I pray, Lord, we'll do it with, with focus and attention on you, with worship and adoration and, and uh, uh, awe and respect and honor as your children. We confess ourselves woefully inadequate, sinful, in error in so much of our lives, Lord. Yet we also see your hand working to change us. And for that, we're eternally grateful. And we, are, we, we, we deliver ourselves to you for those purposes. Lord, we long to serve you. We long to worship you. We long to adore you. We long to see you. Through Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen.